from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Ruth Tam. I'm a producer for the Kojo Namdi Show. Uh, it's a talk show on WAMU, DC's NPR station. Uh, NPR happens to be a media partner of today's festival, which is hosted by the Library of Congress. I want to thank the co-chairman of today's festival, David Rubenstein, and many of the National Book Festival sponsors who have made today's event possible. Today's conversation with Lois Lowry will be followed by a recorded Q&A. So before we get started, I'd like to remind you all to silence your cell phones. My cell phone is down there. <laughs> Nearly every year since 1977, Lois Lowry has published a new book, but perhaps even more impressive than the number of books she's published are the lessons that we've all gleaned from them. She doesn't know it, but when I was eight, Lois Lowry uh, taught me the importance of questioning authority and the value of memory in The Giver. She taught me how to empathize and be brave in Number the Stars, and she gave me a model through her Anastasia series for what it means to be unabashedly yourself. Most of all, Lois Lowry gave me a mirror to see my own life, helping me to better confront my dreams, my curiosities, my fears. Now, Lois Lowry turns that same mirror onto herself in an updated version of her memoir, Looking Back. Please join me in welcoming Lois Lowry. Thank you, thank you. Lois, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, in The Giver, The Giver transmits memories to Jonas, and you wrote your memoir looking back in kind of a similar way. You share your life in bursts of memories with the reader. Uh, I'm wondering, when you wrote the original version of Looking Back in the late 90s, just a couple years after you wrote The Giver, um, was this how you imagined you wanted to tell your story, through a burst of memory? I don't know that it was conscious, consciously related to The Giver. Uh, but certainly my life, like everybody's, is, a, is made up of a set of memories. And when I wrote the f first book, which is shown here, uh, I, I did it by trying to answer the question that so many people have asked and still ask of how I get my ideas. In thinking about that and how to answer it, I realized that many of my ideas for books or many of the things that appear in my books come from my own life. And in thinking about that, I went back through the boxes. In my family, I became the recipient of all the family photographs, including all the blurred snapshots of a cat whose name you don't remember. But in looking through those, I, I identified moments that later appeared in books. And so I put it together in that way, fragments. It's not uh, arranged in any linear, linear fashion. And so to call it an autobiography is, is uh, a mistake. It isn't really, it's not, and then I did this, and then I did that. It's the little pieces that appeared later in books, with the book identified, and then a photograph. My father was a photographer, and so eventually was I, so I had a great store of photographs. Uh, this one of me on the first cover, I'm, I'm about four years old, and I'm interested, and I like the fact that the new version, same book but 20 years added to it, used a different photograph. And uh, what fascinates me about this is that I'm probably five or six. But when I look at this photograph, and this, I think, is relevant to why I write for kids, because I do this. I look at this photograph, and I relive that moment. I remember that moment. I remember how the sand felt on my feet. This is at a lake where we spent summers in Pennsylvania. I remember that horrible bathing suit. And, and I, I look at me. I'm doing this because it was uncomfortable. And I also remember the smell of the, the changing place where we would go in to change our clothes and it was dank and had mold and there was always a daddy long legs on the wall and all of that comes back to me when I see the photograph and throughout the book which is comprised of photographs uh, each one of those photographs does that for me makes me relive that moment as I eventually relived it by rewriting it often with a different protagonist in, in a book for kids. Given the seriousness of some of your best-known works, it's really great to see how funny this memoir actually is. Obviously, the, the cover of the photo is, is a, funny, a funny photo. It's got some humorous uh, memories behind it. Um, I'm wondering, how did you balance memories of happiness um, and with hardships that have happened in your life, namely um, the death of your sister, um, your son, and your partner? Well, uh, 
here's my sister in this photograph with that look on her face like she hates that moment just as much as I did. Uh, and my sister was a very important person in my life. And the book begins, or, or early on, there are a number of pictures. And, and this is a, my only really autobiographical novel, which talks about the two sisters. But here we are here. There are a number of pictures of me and my sister. Um, everybody's life, if they live to any age at all, and I'll be 80 on my next birthday, is going to have episodes of great loss as well as great happiness. And that's what makes up our lives. And so that's what I put into this book, each of those moments. And I talked at length and used a number of photographs. This is a photograph that I have to explain. Sorry about that. But it's an example of what I was just describing. The dress that my sister is wearing in this photograph, and she's seven years old, I'm four, I coveted desperately. I wanted that dress so badly, but it was hers. And the photograph is black and white, but I remember the color of that dress, and it was the exact color of the Campbell's tomato soup that my mother would give us often for lunch. At any rate, here we are again, the two sisters, and I think there's perhaps one more picture here, and here she's teaching me to read. Wait for two seconds because you're turning to the other side. I can hold it. That's fine, thank you. Um, and so here I think this, this shows us something of the importance uh, that my sister her role in my life. And then, of course, later in the book, I don't have photographs of this section of the book, uh, I talk about the death of my sister. Same thing about many years later, uh, the death of my son. Uh, all of those things weave together to create the fabric of, of a life. And, and if you tried to focus on just the sunny days, uh, it would be a dishonest representation. Now, the last time you were at the National Book Festival, you said that The Giver was partly inspired by your aging father. Um, and when his memory began to falter, you were thinking about um, the, how truthful memory is and how it serves us. And I'm uh, curious about how, when you wrote your memoir and when you updated it recently, did you ever question things that happened to you uh, or reinvestigate your feelings about things that have happened in the past? Hmm, complicated question, tough one. Uh, I, I think, you know, as I went through to update it, to add 20 years since the publication and find things, and I included in the updated section the making of the movie The Giver. Uh, I included a number of other things, uh, ch grandchildren who hadn't yet been born during that, that first publication. Uh, and so I went back through all those things and found those moments and the things that related to them in books. I don't think it involved any rethinking because to me 20 years has gone. Anybody here who's my age or around my age realizes how quickly time passes after a certain age. And so uh, for me 20 years has gone back, uh, by in a heartbeat. And it's, those days 19 years ago seem like yesterday to me. So to me they didn't require reinvestigation because they happened yesterday. One question I'd like to revisit. Uh, one of the things that you've said you've always liked about The Giver is that readers could make up their own ending for what happened to Gabe and Jonas. And you liked I the lied, ending. I lied, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you lied. Did anyone send you a letter that tells you you could lie? <laughs> uh, <laughs> people have complained about that. People say, I read that speech you wrote, or, or the Newbery acceptance speech for The Giver, in which you said you weren't going to divulge the, the ending. Uh, at the time I wrote it, I had no plans to write any sequels or follow-up books. But I do respond to um, letters and emails today from, from readers, and I do think about their requests, although I don't always follow their requests. Like, you know, the kid who writes and says, why don't you write an adventure book with a superhero? I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but uh, after The Giver was published, and the ending was ambiguous, purposely so, though I always thought it was an optimistic ending. Uh, many, many, many kids uh, wrote and asked for more books uh, to follow that. And so uh, it was some years later that I wrote the second book, 
and then some years after that, the third, and then finally the fourth and final book, which draws all the characters together. Now I've forgotten what your question was. So oh, I didn't actually I, get to it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I mean, I kind of was wondering why you then decided to change your mind and, and give yeah. the readers what they were asking yeah. for. Yeah. Uh, and also I found, uh, well, OK, confession time. Uh, the, the second book is called Gathering Blue. And that was a book that I did not sit down to write as a companion book to The Giver. Uh, it was a book that was new to me and, and a whole separate book. And I began, as I always do, with a character. And I, I always see the character in my mind. And in this case, I saw a young girl. They always come, interestingly, with a name. Only once have I changed the name from what first came to me, and that was with the book Sun. Uh, but in this case, a girl named Kira, she was a particular age, a young, maybe 14, and I could see her in a certain situation, and that was the beginning of a book. And, and as it began to evolve, I saw it as a time in the distant, it was a very primitive society and, and a kind of a wilderness village. And it was only as I approached the end of it, and that was at the same time that I was still getting so many letters from kids asking about the ending of The Giver, I suddenly thought, I can connect those two books. And so at the very end, unnamed, you see that the character Jonas from the first book is still alive. Kids always know who he is. Adults, because he's not named, sometimes miss that reference. Uh, and so there he was. And, uh, and that book was published, I don't know what year. And, uh, and then the third book, Messenger, uh, goes to the village where Jonas is. And so he's now a character in the third book, and he's an adult. And the little boy from the second book is the main character, the adolescent. Um, I did get some, uh, not complaints, but questions about how could these two places in the first two books coexist at the same time. The world of the giver is so uh, futuristic and the world of Gathering Blue is so primitive. And as I was thinking how to answer that question and whether perhaps I would have to say, OK, guys, it couldn't happen, but give me a break. It's fiction, right? <laughs> uh, but at the time, I had a, a cousin, I still have the same cousin, whose daughter works for the State Department. And, at that, and she goes from place to place, uh, generally two years in each, each embassy. And at that time, she was in Pakistan. So that was happening. My, daughter's, uh, my cousin's daughter, Betsy, was working in Pakistan. And she was emailing home every day and sending photographs from Pakistan. And at the same time, I began to send money each month to a wonderful organization called Women to Women International. And I was given a woman. And I had her picture on my desk. And she lived in Afghanistan in a hut with a dirt floor, and she was trying to raise and educate four children. And she had no electricity and no plumbing. And I was paying so her children could go to school. And, and theoretically, Afghanistan, Pakistan, you could walk from one place to another. It would take you a while, and it would be hard. But those two places coexisted. And so that's how I answered that question about those two books. And now I've, again, forgotten what you asked. <laughs> Sorry. This is the way I write a book, incidentally. <laughs> I start writing about something, and then my mind goes over here, and I add to that and that, and then I forget what I was writing in the first place. <laughs> it generally works. OK, got another question? Well, <laughs> um, it seems like, obviously, from the way you, you approach your, your fiction books and the way you've written your memoir, that you enjoy let's call them non-traditional narratives, and you like a little bit of ambiguity. When you write, how much information do you decide, do you, do you decide to leave in, and what information are you OK with, with taking out and letting the readers take over? That's, that's a good question. Um, I always, I bet most authors would say this, if, if not all, you always know more than is in the book. Um, I'm just thinking of a story I can tell you that might, might, uh, might answer this question in a very graphic way. My very first book was called A Summer to Die. It was published back in 1977. It's still in print. It's un had different covers through the years. But after it was published, I got a 
a letter from a little girl in Denver. And uh, she said she had read this book. And she said uh, she wanted to be a writer when she grew up. I think she was 11 years old. And she was going to enter a writing contest that the Denver Bo Post was holding for kids. And she said, but I just want to ask you some questions. She said that when the, there's a scene in a meadow, and she said, I could just see that meadow. How did you make me able to see that meadow? And I wrote back and I said, I could see it myself in my imagination. And I saw it like a photograph might be of a beautiful meadow. But I couldn't put every blade of grass and every leaf on every tree or every petal on every flower. I couldn't put all of that in the book. And so I had to select. And I had to leave out a lot. And I tried to select what would enable you to see the meadow. I put in just a few details. And you tell me you could see the meadow. And that's what a writer does, put in just enough so the reader can create their own place, their own character, uh, their own whatever. So I got a second letter from the little girl, who incidentally had terrible handwriting. <laughs> and she said, uh, thank you. She said, I, I, I see what you mean. I, now I've read Anastasia Krupnik, in which the child, the second book, the child has a baby brother. And she said, there's a scene where, where you're describing uh, the hallway in their apartment and, and her little brother walking down the hall. And she said, I could just see him. His shoelaces were untied and his, his backside was bulky because he still wore diapers. And there was a stain on the wallpaper because you put those details in. And she said, I could see the whole scene even though you didn't tell me every single thing in it. And I think it was the second letter where she said she was entering the writing contest. So then I got the third and final letter from this child. And it wasn't really a letter. It was a page of the Denver Post that she had folded and put in the envelope. And she'd written in her terrible handwriting on it. I did it. I won. And there is a huge picture of the child. And I can still see her face in my memory. And the caption under the picture was, Blind Child Wins Writing Award. Isn't that an amazing story? You know, if I put that in a book, the editor would say, credibility issues here. <laughs> uh, but I think, uh, despite the fact of, of this child, who would now be in her 40s or 50s even, uh, despite the fact of her particular circumstance, it does illustrate what the answer I'm trying to give to you, which is you just put in just enough so that the reader can create his own world, her own world, uh, and see it. And it will not be the world that you saw, uh, because it's a reciprocal act, book writing. Uh, you do your thing, and they do their thing, and, and you each create a book. That's a beautiful story. Um, I wanted to know, uh, your first book you published in 1977, and in the nearly four decades that have gone by since you've published nearly one book every year. Uh, I'm wondering, when did you realize you first wanted to write books specifically for young people? Uh, I'm going to answer that in two parts. Uh, when did I first specifically know I wanted to be a writer? If anybody here wanted to do boring research, you could find in archives somewhere a 19, August 1947 issue of Jack and Jill magazine, a magazine that was published for children then. And they published letters from children on their two, I don't want to call it a centerfold, but the two center pages. Uh, and in the August issue, 1947, there was a letter from 10-year-old me. Uh, and it's, it said, I am writing a novel. Uh, uh, it was that age at which I already knew I wanted to be a writer. Whatever novel I was then writing never saw the light of day, and I'm sure it was never finished. But I would have been working hard at it. Uh, but I, saw my, I majored in writing in college then when I went off to Brown at age 17. But I envisioned uh, being a writer, and that was my goal. Uh, and it's what I majored in in college, but I envisioned writing for adults. Uh, it never occurred to me to write for kids, though I had been one, though I eventually had four of them before I was 25, incidentally. Um, and it was only when I published a short story in a magazine, which was a magazine for adults, 
I hesitate to tell you the name of it, though it still exists, I think. Uh, but it was Red Book magazine. And at that time, they published fiction. All of these magazines morphed into magazines that now tell you more than you want to know about makeup and clothes and, and your sex life. But at that time, they published uh, fiction. I had published a, a story in Red Book that was a story for adults, but it was about a child. It was seen through the eyes of a child. And when that was published, a children's book editor from Houghton Mifflin read it and wrote to me and said, would you consider writing a book for young people? Uh, it had never occurred to me to do that, but that's with that invitation when I sat down to write what turned out to be my first book, uh, A Summer to Die, which was a fictionalized retelling of the loss of my sister. I think often writers writing a first book will, will incorporate pivotal experiences in their own lives, and that's certainly what I did. So our time with Lois Lowry is coming to a close soon, but we're not going to leave without giving you the chance to ask your own questions. So if you have a question for Lois Lowry, please head on to the mics, and <laughs> we will turn to you. Let's start over here with this. Hi. This <laughs> if you could live in any of your dystopian novels, which one would you want to live in? If I, and when you say the dystopian novels, you're talking about the four that form the Giver Quartet, I yes. think. If I could live in any of those. Uh, you know, I didn't get to the point of talking about the fourth one, Sun, but the village in that one, by the end of the book, uh, is where I would live. Okay. Because it has, through the actions of the various characters, many of them young, been, been healed, uh, and so many of the deep flaws within those different civilizations have, have been changed. Uh, I, I try always to end with an optimistic ending, and I think that one does. So that's where I would live. Thank you. And from here? So after reading The Giver, um, being a science fiction reader, manga reader, H.P. Lovecraft, Douglas Adams, did any of your ideas spark from science fiction, like the type of like color coming into play only after the reader thinking, oh, there's color, and then realizing, oh, they can only see red now? So did any of it come from that? Did any of your ideas come from uh, stories that you saw in science fiction? Were you influenced by that? Con anyway? Confession. I am not a reader of science fiction or fantasy. Uh, I, I, when I was in college, I had to read some of the classic dystopian novels, like 1984 and Brave New World. They were not among my favorites. Uh, and uh, so I never uh, aspired to write science fiction or fantasy. And when I began writing The Giver, I didn't see it as that. Uh, it was only gradually that, that I began to see it was futuristic. But I, you know, I wrote it like a contemporary novel. Uh, it doesn't, and I studiously avoided any science, uh, so that when kids write me today and, and uh, want to know exactly the technology that allowed them to do this, this, or that, I, I tell them I don't have a clue. Yeah, you make it up. <laughs> Your question? Hi. Um, what kind of toothpaste do you use? What was the question? What kind of toothpaste do you use, right? <laughs> you know that my father was a dentist, don't you? <laughs> And I'm curious why you asked that question. Uh, it's, just, it's like an interesting thing to know, I guess. Like, Wait for the people, you know. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting that, that uh, readers, and, and I'm one who feels the same way about authors who, I'd love to know what kind of toothpaste Ian McEwan uses. <laughs> it's, you just, you just want, to, want to get a glimpse into the life of somebody you admire. And so you focus on those little details. Crest is the answer. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, but I, I get emails all the time asking me what kind of food I like and what my dog's name is. And, and it, I think it's just because you want to be friends with, with that author. Uh, and I feel that way about a number of authors, so I understand that. I think we feel that way about you. <laughs> what is the book that you gift to others the most? Um, maybe one by 
maybe a book you didn't write? Um, I want to make sure I heard that correctly. What book do I give other people the most? And do you mean one of my own or? Another book. No, or another said. book. Uh, I'm going to answer that, uh, answer both questions, uh, one of which is my own question. The, the book of mine that, that I most like to give to people is the book called Autumn Street. The one that I mentioned was autobiographical. I love that book, I think, because the people in it were people I loved, and most of whom are gone now. Uh, but obviously, I don't inflict that on, on everybody I know. And so when I'm, when I'm called upon now to give somebody a gift, it depends on, on what's current. And, and I will tell you that the book I've given to people most often uh, this past year was a book, I'm trying to think of the, the title, to get the title accurately. I think it's When Breath Becomes Air, which is a wonderful title, by Paul Kalanithi. Uh, I, I don't have time to go into it. You can look it up. Over here. Hi, I just want to say thank you for your engrossing novels and characters. I've been teaching The Giver for 14 years now. The kids always want to know how does climate control work, and is The Giver Jonas's father? Thank you, thank you. Did you uh, I have a little difficulty hearing these questions. Was there a question at the end of that? I'm yeah, thanking her for is saying. Is the giver Jonas's father? Yeah, is that the question? Oh, the is the giver the Jonas's father? You know, uh, I've been asked that uh, often by kids who actually is, and I think the the process by which they uh, produce children in in that society means that you don't know. It's probably a sperm bank of some sort. So my guess would be no. Uh, but and whatever how does climate you want. control work? Pardon me? How does climate control work? Technology. Look it up. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for a, a couple more questions. Let's take one from here. Um, hello. Um, oh, how do, I, how do I start? You are one of my favorite authors of all time. I've been reading, my mom introduced me to your books when I was, what, nine, ten-ish? And we have, the, we have the collection of the Giver Quartet at home. I absolutely adore your books. And every time I read them, I can see bits of myself, bits of other people I know scattered throughout the book and connections that I can really make with things going on in the real world. So I wanted to know how, it's mostly about the social structure of the communities you create, the worlds that you've built. Is there any main inspiration that came from your life to inspire these like social structures, like the, the, the complete chaos and disarray of, of gathering blue, the order and sameness of the giver? What inspired okay, that I, I, I can answer that for the, the part about the giver. Uh, the, the chaos and, and disarray of gathering blue came from my imagination, I think. Well, I don't think, I know that, and probably uh, influenced by... Uh, for a long time, I've wanted to write a novel set in the 14th century, and so I've read a lot of... I have a whole shelf of books of, uh, about medieval times, and I've not written that novel, but that kind of chaos existed more so in those times. But, but the giver and the order and structure... My father was a career army officer, and I grew up on army posts. And uh, I pictured the world, the, the community that Jonas lived in as looking very much like the army posts that I grew up in. Uh, every day, for example, probably some of you here have military backgrounds, but every day at 5 o'clock, the... Uh, what do they, what do they blow on the bugle at five o'clock? It's not, it's reveille in the morning, it's something at five o'clock. And, and the uh, uh, cannon would go off. And uh, first the cannon, and you'd hear the cannon, and everybody would stop what they were doing. I remember my little brother dropping his bike to the ground and standing solemnly with his hand over his heart. And my mother at the clothesline stopping, putting the clothespin down and standing solemnly. Uh, while we listen to the, the bugle call there in the evening. Uh, that, that seems kind of spooky to me now, uh, but it's the kind of the world of the giver where there are these rules that you follow and, and, uh, and perhaps they, they once had a good reason uh, for having been created and maybe the reason is obsolete. 
Uh, but that's, that was, I think, quite clearly the inspiration for that particular kind of community. I'm sorry to say that that's all the time that we have with Lois Lowry today. The good news is that she's signing books from 2 to 3 p.m. on the expo floor on the lower level. Do so I have time to tell him one funny story? Do we have time? Very quickly. <laughs> Very quickly. Because uh, it's, it's in the yes, book. And, and so this is to, to whet your appetite for the book. I didn't have time here to talk about the movie, but... But uh, when I was in Cape Town watching them film the movie, they asked me if I wanted to be one of the elders seated uh, in a semicircle on the stage at the, at the uh, ceremony. And I said no. Uh, uh, and I said jokingly to Jeff Bridges, the one who had asked me that, I said, now if you'd left the scene in with the naked lady in the bathtub, the old lady in the bathtub, I could have played, I could have played the lady in the bathtub. And he laughed and he knew I was joking. And then on the Stephen Colbert show, he says, she wanted to play the role of the lady in the bathtub. <laughs> okay, thank you. It was all. a joke. <laughs> thank you so much for being with us, Lois Lowry. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.